All right, and we're recording. And I'm lucky enough to have with me today Darren McGarvey, who goes by the stage name Loki. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a Scottish rapper, hip hop recording artist, and social commentator. He was an activist during the Scottish independence referendum in 2014 in favour of independence. Uh, he's done work with the renowned Scottish Violence Reduction Unit, working with young people, and his first book, Poverty Safari, won the 2018 Orwell Prize for Books, with the judges saying it was exactly the book that Orwell would have wanted to win. Which is slightly presumptuous, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did wonder that, how they ch channeling the ghost of Orwell. <laughs> well, everyone projects Orwell in some way or another, don't they? Although I have to say, the most Orwellian thing I've ever experienced is meeting his son, which at the award ceremony, it's him that presents you with the the cheque. There wasn't a prize there at, at the time. That got posted out to me later. So I just had this kind of or Orwellian moment where I'm literally like, holding on to his hand a wee bit too long, thinking, you've actually, like, touched George Orwell, you've actually seen him with your own eyes, and mm -hmm. it's just this window mm -hmm. in history that's closing as every year of his life passes. Yeah. And I just became very aware of that in the moment, just what a privilege that was to just experience that, uh, given that Orwell is such a, a ubiquitous figure in literature and history, and just seems more relevant with every passage of a year, you know? So I, it was a wee aside, but mm. interesting nonetheless. I've got Poverty Safari, I really enjoyed it, and um, I thought it it kind of, it bore some resemblance in like genre terms to uh, Orwell's Down and Out in Paris and London, mm. where he talked about his experience of um, living with practically no money, basically. And in a community, in communities where that was the case, and your book kind of is rooted in that because that's where you came from in Pollock and Glasgow, yeah. quite close to here, and it charts your kind of metamorphosis, if you like, from that origin through to where you are just now, which is... Um, you know, a uh, successful recording artist and cultural commentator. You're on UK-wide TV fairly regularly now. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what do you think about that comparison down out in Paris and London? Well, funnily enough, I read The Road to Wigan Pier uh, just before I began the final stretch of the writing process. So... What it really encapsulated for me was, hang on, it doesn't matter if I'm not talking about these big overarching ideas in the way that academics do. Because as much as, as much as um, you know, often people will kind of remark on me being articulate or, or being clever, uh, uh, which kind of is implied that that's surprising because of my socioeconomic background. Actually, when I'm writing, I'm always thinking of the smartest person I can imagine reading it and scrutinising it, mm -hmm. you know, so it's going through a very, very, it's got to reach a very high standard in my mind. But sometimes that can take me away from the heart of something. Uh, and it's the same with music, you know, you can be fancy with words, so you can talk from the heart. And with The Road to Wigan Pier, more so the first part of the road to Wigan Pier, the second part's very kind of, actually I took a lot of comfort from it because I could see it was a very unfocused, slightly prejudiced rant, you know, the sort of stuff that I, I'm prone to writing from time to time, mm -hmm. although um, I've got a bit better with the editing process as I've gone along. But one the first that, part I went of... to um, uni for a year doing English and uh, one of the lecturers said that he thought Orwell was a much better essayist than he was book writer. Yeah. And that he could become unfocused. Aye, aye. Well, I, I found the, the first part where he's just charting his journey through the working class towns uh, and he's writing about things like um, sausages and ovens and coal fires. Uh, and, and suddenly I was like, so this stuff is interesting to an audience because I've got loads of experience of all this minutia of mm -hmm. working class life. You know, the greasy spoon cafes that are so dirty and greasy when you walk into them that you wonder, why am I here? It's so tight for space, especially if you're rotund, having visited too many of them. 
And then you realise that they're usually encased in four walls of sugar. And that that's the draw subconsciously, you know, they're, they're, they're brightly coloured and a big fridge full of fizzy juice and it's it's the it's not necessarily the environment that's drawn you in. It's the it's the call of all of these stimulants and substances in the food from the fat and the grease to the salt and the sugar that just has you going back there time and time again. But I realised actually that that I could write about just visiting. One of those cafes with my granny, which we did all the time, and how that generational uh, attitude to food is passed down. So she came from a time of, of 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 genuine austerity. You know, it wasn't ideological. It was like people didn't have a lot, man. You had to make things go far. Mm. So if you got like butter or or sweets. It was like you know, it was a bit more like in older times where you get that you get that reward in your your biology. Your you kind of spike. You're you're happy. You're like cool. It'll be nice in a couple of weeks when I get another one. And now in this age of 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 everything being plentiful, not just plentiful, but really rammed down our throats in a way we've never seen before. Then you know when you're taking an old eating habit. And applying it to the current context, it's only going to lead to um, problems, you know, overeating and not really knowing how to navigate what has been up until very recently, a very disingenuous industry where they, they look at us and they think, what do they want to be eating? How can we make them think that they're eating the thing that they want while pumping it full of this other shit that we know is going to get them coming back, you know, kind of the way drug dealers work when they're hanging around outside schools. Yeah, absolutely. Aye. I mean, the association with um, something positive that you touched on where you would visit the the Greasy Spoon Cafe with your granny and get sweets and get fizzy juice and get stuff that's fried in veg oil and all the rest of it. Yeah, um, McDonald's has turned that into an art form because they put actual soft play in uh, restaurants in all communities but maybe where they're most valued is in communities where people don't have as much money so it means you get a two for one you can take your kid along they'll be happy because they're getting juiced up on mad food mm. or sort of semi food and then also they get to play in a in a safe environment where maybe there aren't many yeah we we um one of the things that's interesting about mcdonald's is that all of the horror stories about what what the McDonald's supply chain entails ethically um, or in terms of health, you know, right from the the kind of the industrial farming practices right along until how workers are treated and how tax is paid and profit is extracted from society and all that. And then when you're actually sitting down hungry... Uh, it shows you how, you know, your primitive brain is really in control, you know, it's that kind of rider and the elephant analogy where it looks like the rider's in charge but the rider's job is really to make sure the elephant is happy and if the elephant, as primitive as an elephant might seem, isn't happy, the rider's not got a chance, you know, so you sit down there armed to the teeth with all of the knowledge about food and what you should be eating and all of these great intentions you set out with that morning. But in a moment of tiredness, when the stress response kicks in, your body's just like, I appreciate you've got all these ideas, but I've got my own ideas and these are very hardwired. So you're now eating a McFlurry with tears streaming down your face, <laughs> wondering how did I end up back in that, here? I think that's the new flavour, actually. <laughs> tears. <laughs> Aye, salty tears. But no, I've 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 been on my own journey with that. For me, it began really obviously. You're kind of inculcated into bad eating. Mm -hmm. A very young age, my first Halloween, I was dressed as a can of coke. That's how ubiquitous <laughs> sugar was in my life. And <laughs> literally on Halloween, the whole thing is to go and beg neighbours for chocolate. Yeah. And you no, know, so the whole thing is based around the food. One it's of our many junk food based holidays. Think about Valentine's Day with chocolates, Easter with chocolate, Halloween with sweets. Christmas is basically a way to get pumped full of, you know, unhealthy food now. So it's just like, it's that particular dent in the calendar. Yeah, even the gym rats hit it hard at Christmas when it comes to junk food. You know, you see people that you know are very disciplined and don't have that 
neurocircuitry where it's extremely difficult to retain discipline when it comes to food and even at Christmas they are like I think I'll just keep on firing into those toffee coins until I fall asleep <laughs> um, but I so you begin you, you there was a lack of education about food where where I come from and this was not just in the household this was this was right across every institution that we dealt with you know and primarily school so they used to interrupt classes wheeling tuck trolleys into our classroom Selling us sweets during lessons, man. So that you says, you, you, you were a, an income stream for them. Yeah, and that says a lot. But then also, what that was creating was these associations, which are very hard to break. So this idea that chocolate is something that you reward yourself with, um, that never leaves you. You know, think of the psychology of someone who's struggling on a diet that they've adopted, an unsustainable diet that's not got anything in it that they enjoy. So eventually, they get to a point where they're like. I'll just have something, I deserve it, I've done so good up to now. Because they're an adult, they look in the mirror, they see an adult, they don't think, I'm still thinking like a four-year-old school child, you know? They're bargaining with themselves in a disingenuous way. We all do it with different things, you know? Some people will do it with whatever their vices happen to be, or they'll do it in relationships. But it all begins then, when the whole aim of the game is, I need to get this thing to make me feel contented or satisfied and the key thing is if I don't get it there'll be problems and I used to have real deep emotional experiences with being denied these things as a kid um, because it wasn't just that they were being withdrawn to punish you or they, were, they weren't available because we had no money at one day or whatever but also it was you had made that emotional connection that this will complete me in this moment you transfer that onto so many things in life, but I think when it comes to things like sugar and, and terrible food, it's extremely consequential. Yeah, you end up with these um, complicated uh, social and physical cues around your dopamine circuits in your brain that you know uh, healthcare professionals struggle to understand. Never mind yourself in the moment yeah. when. You know, you've say you've had a a a, a bad night's sleep or uh, something stressful's happened to you. Um, your blood sugar goes, you know, all wrong, and um, all of these things are playing into the hands of companies who can exploit it. Yeah, and it happens here, there, and everywhere. It's really interesting hearing that you got your um, your sweets delivered to your classroom. And um, and that you've struggled a lot with sugar. I mean, you've you've spoken a lot and written a lot about your addictions to other things as well in the past. Mm. I mean, what at what point in your life do you think you became an addict? Well, that's a good question. I do believe there is a many there are many lenses through which to view addiction. Some people see the disease model, and that works for them. Uh, now that might work on an individual level when you're when it's when recovery is just contingent on how you perceive it and conceptualize it so that you can thrust yourself forward through it. But obviously, when we're trying to get more empirical about it, then the 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 general consensus around addiction is that it's a kind of toxicity threshold that a person reaches, uh, where the amount of a substance or behavior that they're engaging in and the reward that they're getting. Uh, neurologically for it just passes a point of no return where you cannot unlearn or rewire a short circuit in brain you know and I find this to be true certainly for me now there are other kind of counter arguments to that some people will say people can unlearn addic addiction now maybe they can when it comes to things like alcohol and drugs though that are really disinhibitive I don't think you should be experimenting with trying again if you've had a long period of sobriety because that, that that substance is psychoactive in a sense that it changes your whole paradigm of thought. So you can't apply what you know sober to what you know drunk because the minute you have a drink, you're like, what about a wee bag of gear as well, you know? Yeah. Um, for me, what it means is if I am turning to a behaviour or I'm turning to a substance uh, or any form of stimulus, really, that activates that reward circuitry. If I'm doing that because I'm stressed, or I'm doing that to get away from 
the usual feelings of discomfort associated with being human, then I build up a strong association with it to the point where actually using the thing becomes problematic. So the ben- the, the kind of risk ratio, the risk benefit ratio becomes topsy turvy, where actually you can't stop doing this thing, even though it's very clear that it's causing more problems than it's solving. And you know, with alcohol, drugs, at times sex, pornography, you know, I've 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 got a very it's just it's my neural circuitry seems to be quite extreme. Uh, and also impulsivity, you know, stress affects impulsivity. So you, you your kind of limbic system takes over the decision making process or at least reduces what a sensible decision would be and deprioritizes it. So you're aware that the good decision's somewhere in the mix. But the bad decision's making a very compelling case for itself and it's been in the background the whole time just waiting to come out and go, I'm your guy, you know? And this has been the same with food, you know, kind of um, nutrient void food that's it's, it's serving a purpose, it'll satiate you to a degree, but it's also creating dehydration, it's creating toxicity, conditions for poor health, poor mental health. And it actually took me a long time just to educate myself and understand, no, Lucozade isn't a sports drink or brown bread isn't a health food. These things are okay if you can have one or two. But if, like me, you just find yourself going through them once you've started, then you need to get a bit smarter about foods that keep your blood sugar stable so you don't have tiredness and fluctuating energy. And actually, I, one of the reasons I ended up, not to bring politics into it too much, but one of the reasons I ended up voting Remain, um, despite having a lot of solidarity with a lot of the concerns, um, diversely expressed as they are in the, 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 the Brexit camp, uh, was the fact that actually EU-wide food labelling not only gave me a kind of foot in the ground in terms of just coming to grips with the fact that this is a supermarket is an obstacle course that's designed to confuse you. But actually, I believe that the food labelling is what was the kind of catalyst in this whole emerging field of thought around food ethics. What's in our food? We have a right to know what's in our food. We want better food. People who make bad food that hurts people and hurts animals and the environment. We're not buying their food and there should be a cost attached to that. Without labelling honestly on the food there's nowhere to begin that conversation and and what that showed to me was not only the advances that we had made in terms of of understanding food better but also that actually our governments when they collectivize can rein in some of these corporate forces that they to be fair unleashed on the world and so many of the problems in the globe right now are are are, are the same where we've given multinationals a, a blank check to solve all the problems of the world, but they're only motivated by profit. And, you know, the problems are all around us, social media, food, mental health, um, you name it. Where the whole machinery of the state is all being used to try and mop up the mess because no risk assessments were performed. And, you know, that's, that's, that's what I think that the EU, for all its flaws, uh, they can find Google. Do you know what I mean? They can say no Coca-Cola, no Kellogg's, you want access to our market and we're bigger than China and we're bigger than America, then start putting on your products how much crap is in it and stop all the jiggery pokery and all the smoking mirrors. It's interesting because once you constrain them, you see how creative they are even within those restrictions to still be deceptive because they're drawing on such a vast pool of knowledge about human psychology even how chocolate's designed to melt in your mouth within a certain time frame, just when you're ready to take another one. And you think, well, if all the same thought went into designing a library, mm-hmm. uh, as goes into designing a shopping mall or a bar of dairy milk uh, that's all ergonomically designed for you, then you know, we might make a wee bit more progress <laughs> in society. But it's immensely confusing, isn't it? Um, Absolutely, yeah. There's a couple of really interesting points there. The, the idea about... Um, hedonistic food being um, used by big food companies to get you to consume, consume, consume. That's obviously a thing. But um, I think there's sometimes a false dichotomy between 
the idea of hedonistic food and healthy food. I think actually uh, evolution would be stupid if it didn't make healthy food hedonistic at the same time. So what's happened is a hijacking of our neural circuits by um, a technology really, you know, refined sugar is a technology. Uh, it, it's, it in itself isn't evil. You know, I can't remember who said it, but uh, you know, uh, America didn't, America dropped a, a nuclear bomb over Japan. They didn't drop a physics over Japan. Yeah, yeah. So the fact that we can refine sugar now, I don't even know how that came about, but it might have been finding out how to refine something that we use every day that saves lives or whatever. You know, it's a technology, it's kind of a passive thing, but it's how we apply that technology. And the thing about uh, regulation comes up again and again at the moment. So something that's happening in the moment is a, um, a, a kind of uh, comment gathering section of the uh, US Dietary Administration, I think it is, it's the USDA, they're looking at um, bringing in new guidelines. I think they do it every five years or so. And there's, if you ask anyone in nutrition about what the US Dietary Authority guidelines do, then you'll get a different answer. So you, you could find a consultant doctor who'll say uh, that, they're, that they're great and you can find a consultant doctor that will say they're miserable. And what happened when the what happens when the, the dietary authority brings out new guidelines, they more or less get migrated all over the world and food companies to a large extent respond to them. So when I don't know if you know much about the story of how fat per se was demonized. Yeah, and that's when they got all the fat free stuff with the sugar in it to make it taste better. Exactly. So in some respects, companies should be I mean, my personal opinion on it is that unfettered corporate action is daft because you get these weird um, sort of fake incentivizations. Um, you know, like my old boss when I worked in a in a in a production setting, crying because we'd managed to achieve a particular you know key performance indicator that meant the share price would be slightly higher. And I thought, well, what is that man's life? Well, that's what's going on. But you get all these things in, in the corporate setting. And I think regulation to some extent is a really good idea because of that. You know, you, you can be you can damage individuals' health, the environment, uh, employees' health, all that sort of stuff. But you've got to be careful because one person's um, regulation is another person's really stupid idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel obviously that, that regulation sometimes, I'm sure, can be a bit overbearing and silly in places where they're not necessarily required. I mean, as, as a former youth worker and someone who's very much rooted in communities for a long part of my working life and my personal life, uh, a lot of the regulations around how local authorities and young people and all of that stuff can be not only overbearing, but actually doesn't address what the threat the threats to young people are. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, you're talking more on a broader kind of corporate s scale. The regulations, right or wrong, those are the reins, the mechanisms by which the governments of the day attempt to make corporate power work for society. There is a relationship, I feel, between the, the profits of many of these companies and the cost to society when we actually look at the externality, you know, the, the unfortunate byproduct of an economic decision or transaction at corporate level. So on one hand, profits are up. Everyone likes salted caramel burgers and vegetable oil. We've found the ultimate product, you know, profits are up. And that is a metric, quite rightly, that's measured and says, well, profits are up. Efficiency's up. We can employ more people. This is good for the economy because everything's been measured in GDP. So that's the only metric that determines whether our society is doing well or not. But of course, when everybody starts eating these, you know, vegetable, fried, burgers, 
whatever they are. Um, we have obesity problems, we have diabetes, we have the mental health blowback of people constantly consuming nutrient void foods. Uh, so this places pressure on the health service, this places pressure on mental health services, and that's just in the domain of health that we're discussing. Um, so what I feel we need to get better at, and I think that the, the, the kind of the, the awareness or growing awareness around food is a big part of what's going to shift this balance, because what I, what I like about... What I like about that movement is not just that it's politicised and sometimes it can be very direct and very strident and that's necessary, but also it understands that we are operating within a capitalist society where what you spend means more than who you vote for. And so what they try to do is encourage people to withdraw uh, their money from products and services that contribute to this problem and actually for all of the flaws of capitalism, corporations are very intuitive, so they will immediately change. You know, whether it's who's playing such and such in a film, uh, uh, or whether it's, you know, how many litres of water does a urinal use. Uh, the corporation is set up to be able to adapt very quickly. I think this was partly why neoliberalism was attractive initially, because it wasn't as cumbersome as the state. So in a sense, there is a kind of liberal idea behind it, but it was based on the fallacy that if the companies were rich and the CEOs were rich, they would all pay 50% tax and the money would trickle down to everybody. We know that's not happened. But one of the benefits of the corporation, if we could somehow rewrite its DNA and say, your job isn't just to guarantee profit for your shareholders, your job is to make sure that your staff are all paid well and we'll give you a tax cut if uh, less of them are signing off with mental health problems. Um, you know, we can change the DNA of the corporation to make it suit us. They're not quite just as powerful that they can resist that. They still need markets. They still need places to sell their products. Um, but actually, it's the definition of the corporation itself, I feel, that's the main problem. And that was designed by government, obviously, with a lot of corporate people looking over their shoulders, thinking, oh, think about it. It takes a lot of pressure off you if we're providing a monolithic... Uh, structure that serves everything, you know, and we'll deal with the cost of that, we'll deal with you can go and talk about the overinflated employment figures and not mention how badly all the pensioners are being paid before they die working and uh, I feel that that in society generally would be the key to addressing so many problems, whether you're talking about Facebook Twitter, the issues with these things, food right across the spectrum but there needs to be a public appetite to do that, which means educating the public, which means getting out there and sometimes fighting for things. Uh, because the government will respond if they think that the public have an appetite for it. That's why we're getting Brexit. That's why we've got the hostile environment. As much as I personally find these things distasteful and dangerous sometimes, so many other people want these things and the government is basically saying, well, your democracy's consumerist as well. So the more you want that thing, the more likely I am to facilitate it. And it's like, how do we bounce back from this period and say, what, what are our new values as a society? What are our new progressive values? How do we express that in politics, in the economy, even right down to our purchases? Uh, I personally find it difficult to spend my money responsibly sometimes um, when it comes to food, when it comes to diet, when it comes to recycling. Um, it's old habits. It's an old habits thing. But that awareness is there. And I think there's an informal social control creep creeping in. And informal social controls are important. Whenever there's informal social controls, that means the government don't get involved. When I'm standing in a town like Burnham in Perth, I know I can't drop my cigarette down in the street. The whole area is crying out to me without saying a word. This is not the behaviour that's acceptable here. Whereas in Poso, if you're standing outside the Saracen Head pub, the ashtray's literally ripped out the wall <laughs> and flung on the ground. It's just this futile expression of not giving a fuck. Um, and I think where food is concerned, informal social controls are creeping in, where actually as much as the left is losing a lot just now politically, I think we're winning the war when it comes to creating new expectations 
in society and social groups and communities, not just around things that should and shouldn't be said, but behaviour, things we should be considering. And long term, that's rooting quite deeply. When we manage to get a grip of the political situation, I think it might actually all coalesce quite nicely. But maybe I'm being over-optimistic. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I mean, my take on all that is that the informal social control tends to come in, like if you imagine, I don't know, 100 years ago, and you think about something like, uh, I don't know, veganism, for example, then veganism is very old, and you get um, vegetarian and vegan movements going back quite a long way, and you suspect that they probably went back prehistory but you know Hitler was vegetarian you get you get this movement of um uh you know um white supremacy with vegetarianism but then you also get people who are on the left extremely well meaning in terms of their um their their view on the environment on animal welfare on what's best for their health and for probably for the last 40 years that's been the bulk of vegetarians in wet in the west so in the past you might have these little groups uh that you maybe would have heard of through some um you know curious news story at the back of the times or something like that but now everything's uploaded immediately in hd to the internet for everyone's perusal so i think in terms of informal social control You've got an environment now where it's it's difficult not to be informed. You might be misinformed, but you you will be informed. Yeah. And the information's there. So I think what we're finding is that the left-right paradigm is actually rupturing a little bit. And so things that have traditionally been seen as left and that have been um, important to... Uh, to display as a as a left wing person, or or if you're right wing, uh, similarly, they are starting to crumble a bit as the extremes are pushed. So you know if you identify as left wing now and you've found this, I've seen it happen, and you say something that is n- not traditionally left wing, then you get flamed. Yeah. And the problem with that is that. We've got access to so much information now and intelligent people are pretty good at processing it on the whole that actually the truth comes out. So just because you're wanting to be tribal and people want to be tribal all the time about whether, you know, left or right wing. Which is natural eating, so, isn't exactly. that something? Um, you know, the, the, uh, the, I think the, the, the informal social control aspect is huge and it's actually moving in the right direction. Um, whether you're talking about left or right wing politics or whether you're talking about the food environment yeah and I think the best elements of of all of all of those debates are admitting where they're wrong and seeing that um, these old paradigms are starting to sort of become less relevant yeah I, definitely social media um, has been a big part in that because social media I, I believe is is you know a lot of people will say what is happening to our politics you know why are things so difficult now first of all that's based on the delusion that it's not always been nightmarish when everybody has a voice hence why until very recently not everyone had a voice but also social media much like food um, is, is, is information set in such a grand scale that we can't process it. You know, it's like being unable to metabolise ethanol so you're an alcoholic or it's like having issues around glucose and sugar so you might be diabetic. You know, the, the, the amount of information that's available to us, the amount of competing takes on it and our primitive brain's desire to impose simple narrative in order to feel orientated and secure is part of the issue. So like food, which is now mass produced and has been for about 50 years, we now have mass information, high speed information, which we are not actually evolved to deal with individually. Collectively, we're like a big processor. We can manage just to survive enough with just enough information. 
But at an individual level, we are not uh, that dissimilar to, you know, the human beings that evolved in the African savannah, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, really, with slight modifications culturally, linguistically, we've got a lot of the same software, you know, hardwired, the same basic core apps. And uh, so social media creates this almost revelatory environment and it is a revolutionary force. I mean, it began the Arab Spring. Everybody thought it was going to be the left that would use social media. They were like, Occupy, what is Occupy? We don't know, you know? <laughs> Occupy what? <laughs> and actually what happened was it was the forces on the right and conservatism that occupied social media and just gave us a beating for years where we all fought with each other about who should be allowed to play Akira, do you know what I mean? <laughs> or what? And it was like, uh, I feel now there's, there's certainly a lot of truth in what you're saying, that people tend to find common cause with other people because they have a common enemy now and that people become endeared to one another and then they open up to their oppositional points of view because they're like, we have this common enemy, you know, whether it's constitutional issues, for example, or whether it's issues around identity. I think nationalism and identity go hand in hand. Then you you do see a kind of fragmentation where actually you'll get people, you know, whether you're talking about, and not to take the podcast in this direction, but, you know, when you look at the trans debate, right? There's a perfect example of how people who consider themselves to be the vanguard of progressivism can immediately become the villains in their own story and receive the same level of criticism as the misogynist that they were once fighting. And so it's like, in a social media environment, that's how quickly the sand can shift beneath you. So people cling onto new allies and new ideas, partly because it's like a drowning person trying to keep their head above the water as the sea gets more choppy. Mm -hmm. and, and and certainly when you look at um when you when you look at how political debate has kind of evolved in this period, where even though I would consider myself obviously still very left leaning, uh and 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 have questioned thoroughly what what part of those attachments or were passed down or second hand, what ideas do I need to rethink? At the same time I've found a great benefit in being exposed to ideas or understanding the understanding the intellectual underpinnings of ideas that were once just avatars mm -hmm. or caricatures for me and understanding that there are many moral worlds at play yeah, and they're like, not all uh, equivalent. Like a sort of law and order priority, for example, Aye. which is traditionally seen as like a sort of right-wing, John Wayne, sheriff-type character. You think, well, how cruel can that person be? Yeah. But then you scratch the surface and that's just someone who has that as a priority in their life, like maybe you and I, because I, I, I identify with left-leaning with with left -leaning politics more for sure, would prioritise care for the vulnerable, for example. Yeah, but the Conservative would say, you don't have a state from which liberties and rights and compassion can emerge without law and order. So they see that as the basic ingredient of the democracy, the rule of law. And, and and sometimes they can be quite consistent with it as well. I mean, the Daily Mail goes as hard after bankers as it does after criminals. Yeah. If if its reader if the editor believes its readership is going to be offended by a certain thing, they screech and screech about it. I know some of the takes of the Daily Mail. I don't read the Daily Mail a great deal, although it's good to sort of understand what it is and the role that it plays. Um, you know, this idea of b breaking the law. Uh, is consistent, you know what I mean? Now, there, there obviously there'll be exceptions to the rule, as we all have our exceptions, you know, sometimes we don't hold certain people to the same standard as we hold others because of a lot of biases at play. But law and order, obviously, is, is a mindset, it's a moral value, and like everything that emerges out of brain chemistry, do you know what I mean? So, depending of, on, on your cultural setting, your brain chemistry, your how your particular gene pool has evolved, you might be more susceptible to these ideas. Uh, and I think it's it's a kind of it's a diversity of all of it that gives society its shape. I think sometimes we can't always be progressive. Just like sometimes you can't always just be open to all these new experiences all the time. Like 
oh yeah cool let's just go out and say hello to everybody you know cool go everyone come doors. and stay with me everybody in you come you know uh, or, or or other metaphors of that nature then sometimes you've got to say it's time to lock the door you know what I mean or or we can't eat all the food just now because we don't know when the next food is coming uh, we need to tighten our belts a wee bit and a successful life uh, certainly in my household is, is, is a bit of a mix of all of these things sometimes you're out there exploring the world and being a bit frivolous and other times you're kind of being a bit more reserved and you're well conservative and your impulses certainly since having kids I've noticed the conservative impulses that come with it interesting aye and no, not, not in a political sense in the truest sense where suddenly you have something to conserve yeah so you're like Oh, right, okay, so on one hand, I'm all about fairness and I'm all about everyone being equal, but you know that if someone had a gun to my head and said, is it my kid or your kid, mm -hmm. then it's your kid. There's just no question about that, and that's cruel mm -hmm. and horrible. But even the thought of harm coming to my kid right now is eliciting a very irrational, intellectually irrational, but evolutionarily rational response which is this is my child and I will fucking kill every one of you try to hurt, hurt him or her you know um, and that's a conservative instinct I'm mm. sorry it just is um, one of the other things I think that's interesting apart from all the corporate forces uh, and, and social media and all these things that we've discussed this phenomenon of having elderly people in our society is relatively new I mean People living to 70, 80 and 90 is unheard of in the last, and in, 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 in only in, until the last 100 years, right? Well, I would say that in times before that, in um, since the Industrial Revolution, then that might be true because people were worked to the bone until they died. But I think there's not much evidence going before that, that... Um, if you if you didn't if you made it past about sort of ten years old, then actually you would be likely to live for you know your your three score and ten until you were about that age. There's no evidence that that didn't happen, mm. and the there's not there's not any real evidence that we you know lived until we were forty and then died in the Paleolithic times or you know pre agriculture. Mm. Um, it takes some explaining about why you would, why collectively we would want people who are physically decrepit around mm. because they're less able to hunt or gather. But I think there's a lot to be said about the theory of passing on wisdom, of childcare, yeah. of just um, being able to say, look, you shouldn't go over that hill because there's like, a ravine and at the bottom it's full of poisonous plants or whatever it is yeah. um, but these are all speculations and if the, the nearest thing we have to looking into the past is uh, modern hunter-gatherer tribes that were left isolated for long enough that when people uh, from the west stumbled upon them they could draw some conclusions about how maybe we did used to live and there was plenty of elderly people there. So once you live past 10 or so years, because, I mean, the something that has changed much more is the child infant mortality rate. You know, you'll have seen those figures maybe. Aye. where That's the big justification for capitalism often, isn't it? Yes, that it's raised standards Aye. up to that um, point where, say, one in, one in four children died mm. in... Um, Almost every country, if you go back far enough, but certainly in Africa, for example, until probably 50 years ago or something like that. So, and now it's down to, you know, probably 10% or so in the worst places. And in places like the UK, it's like under 1%, um, having been about, I think, 4 or 5%, probably 100 years ago or so. But um, the way we deal with elderly people now in society is I think um, a big issue partly because we're discon more disconnected from them and it'd be really interesting to hear what you were about to say but um, I think the other main thing is that they're getting ill 
and I don't think that used to happen. So the 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 hunter gatherer tribes that were that were found, um, or that were you know, you know they were there before they were found. But you know what I yeah, mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They uh, they they had old people who were in good health until they, you know, maybe uh, died of um, an accident or you even hear about a tribe who uh who's it was someone's job to kill old old people when it was decided by everyone that it was their time right because they might be a bit of a burden mm. so it's an interesting tension yeah I, mean, I would imagine partly that would be you know and the more kind of hunter gatherer societies would be less pathogens because they're not talking to people from other continents uh, so they're more resilient to the pathogens within their own environments and then almost no carcinogens yes. so there's no pollution everything that's going in and out is almost natural part for like human waste but just still natural but obviously can be toxic so that might explain that slightly but actually my point was more about the strain that longer life expectancy places, not necessarily just on public services like social care. Yep. When you have more people in a society living for longer, you have to recalibrate how resources are distributed. Yep. But also the tension it places on discourse because you have to imagine, or at least I try to contemplate this, when you look at some of the kind of conservative viewpoints that I might consider to be quite reactionary, are quite, you know, symptomatic of people who have lost touch with, with, with society as it is. In truth, those used to be young people and they probably considered themselves quite progressive in their youth. Now, I'm only 35 and already. Some of the young people, with what they say and what they do kind of frightens me a wee bit or annoys me a wee bit. Now, imagine you live to 60, 70, 80, 90 and the society that you've lived in has changed at a pace that has left it almost unrecognisable in every conceivable way, how badly would you cling to your old ideas just to feel secure, even if you were secure? I mean, when you look at the 130,000 or so members of the Conservative Party that are currently in the driving seat of British democracy, a lot of them are elderly rural Conservatives. They're a very, very powerful group, very, very enfranchised, very, very involved. They want to participate. They want to fight for their values. Values that were cool when they were young. And now they're not cool. And they're evil bastard scum and all that rest of it, right? And all that, all the, the hyperbole gets thrown around. But sometimes I'm just sitting there and I'm just thinking, these are old people. And the world is frightening them. And they're frightened. And so the editors of their newspaper are trying to create stuff that reflects the views of their readers, so the newspapers are frightening. And and it's not necessarily that we should be apologising for views we find distasteful. I mean, some of the views associated with that school of conservatism have definitely had their day, let's say that. Stuff around women's reproductive rights, get it to fuck, do you know what I mean? Like, if you care that much about human life, you've got to care about it the whole lifespan. You can't just care about the fetus yeah. and then drop the mother into the hostile environment welfare state and say, you're on your own now, you know what I mean? And I think it's, I, I completely agree, actually, there's there's this uh, there's this rank hypocrisy on the right around that issue. Mm. And I think it appears on the left, most notably for me, where um, vegans who don't want to kill animals because they want to confer them with equal rights to humans, which is a, a notion that I disagree with, but they are typically in favour of abortion rights and I'm not saying you know one way or another whether they're right or not but that, that's an inconsistency yeah, too yeah yeah and it's, it's interesting when you start kind of picking it apart like that and also the justifications that we all have to reconcile these things that sometimes don't make yeah, a lot but, of sense yeah but ah, it's different for me it's complicated <laughs> yeah. you know I've got a deeply held moral conviction these old people I mean they've only been alive three times longer <laughs> than me and survived a war and all that you know um, but definitely I feel like this is one of the factors that is playing a massive role in political discourse right now and something perhaps that our leaders are responding to but more reacting to rather than responding. Um, I don't know what it says. I don't know what it says about that generation but what it's got me thinking about is 
if society continues to to change at this pace, and it's not just a perception thing, you know, for a very long time, you could have been born one century and four decades later, life wouldn't have been that great deal different, right? In our lifetime, in the 35 years we've been cutting about, everything seems different. Everything happens faster. There's more information. It's overwhelming. So I wonder if perhaps in that context, every person is doomed to become reactionary in their old age because unless you can just keep moving with every change that's suggested by the younger generation, whatever it might be, there's going to be a point where you cling to your values so tightly that that uh, you'll take all the criticism that comes with it and you'll, you'll go down fighting. Yeah. And, and that's kind of worrying and kind of interesting. I mean, are our grandchildren going to be uh, 80 year olds in their VR pod saying that they're not going to upload their brains into the <laughs> internet because that's just that's just mental. Yeah, exactly. And 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 I think the you when it comes to dealing with that problem that and it's not this is not by the way to say that every single person who's of a certain age is conservative uh, or that every single young person is is progressive. Because there are exceptions to all the rules, but I think the polling data kind of indicates that there is a trend and that around about the age of 47, if people are going to switch, it's going to happen around that time. I mean, I've heard the, I don't know who, who said it originally, if anyone knows, but the the phrase, if you're um, not pre- uh, progressive when you're young, there's something wrong with your heart. And if you're not conservative when you're older, there's something wrong with your head. Yeah, I, 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 I'm familiar with that quote as well. Um, but I, th- I think obviously that I haven't just like talked about you know having kids and what that's done. One of the things I've noticed this year as well, because my my whole social mobility has been put into overdrive at a time where a lot of other communities and families are at a total standstill. So the success of the book and all the opportunities that's come my way and TV and radio and theatre and just literally most of the opportunities I got offered I had to turn down because there's not enough hours in the day to do them. Um, but noticing suddenly the new pressures that come into play when you start making money. Um, so formerly my whole political worldview was informed by feeling excluded or feeling socially immobile and creating an audience and an appetite for my work on that basis. This year, you know, and that's what I'm kind of exploring at the fringe, is you can't go through the sort of transition that I'm going through just now like socially, financially, and so on and so forth, uh, without your interests at least trying to change the rider and the elephant, you know? Cause suddenly I'm like um, getting an insight into this idea of the centre ground where people on the left and the radical left particularly in working class communities they, they look at the centre ground and they see people who, who, who clearly have enough. They live in big houses, they drive cars, they have cleaners, they have childcare, um, they have respectable jobs that have prestige attached to them often. Um, and they think, well, why are you so frightened of radical policies where you might need to pay a wee bit more? Um, but see, actually, when you start earning more... Um, what you what I noticed immediately was that I didn't feel any more secure because insecurity is built into the system. So we're constantly like wheeling tuck trolleys into classrooms. We are bombarded with what is the next destination. There is not a plateau that you arrive at where you go, I have enough. Mm-hmm. Because in a growth economy, that's a dead end. So suddenly you're like, I made this amount of money, how much tax am I paying? Right, this is why middle class people keep receipts for everything. <laughs> okay, I understand. Oh shit. You know <laughs> what I mean? And so you're like, I thought I earned a lot of money, but I feel insecure. And also it's not just my lifestyle that's at stake now because I'm the breadwinner and I cover everything. So if there's a fluctuation in my income, that has a ripple effect on all these other people. And you become like a logistical operation, especially if you're in the industry of entertainment or books or whatever. And suddenly you're like, I'm still under pressure. I still feel overworked. 
but I can't share these problems now because they look, they're terribly indulgent and all the people around me, a lot of them still live in poverty and still in crisis. And so then I, I, I really began to feel a sense of not solidarity, wrong word. I started finding in some areas of my life I will have to go to somebody who has money for advice. So you start developing social connections out with your traditional social realm. Mm -hmm. Because I can't go to my pal who lives in such and such and be like, look man, I made this much, but then I also decided to get married and do the windows up and buy my sister a car and do all these things. And then I got a tax bill in and now I'm like in a figure four leg lock. And I'm like, is this normal for the first year where your financial <laughs> position changes? Money loses its value, you overextend yourself, suddenly you're back in a hamster wheel. I have to talk to somebody who's made a bit of money mm -hmm. about that problem. Mm -hmm. Because one, I don't want to seem rude or inconsiderate. And two, what level of insight is somebody who's never made that amount of money going to bring to the table unless they're coming from a spiritual angle, which I'm totally open to, mm -hmm. which is money's not real. <laughs> Shut up, Dan. You know what I mean? But when you're getting down to the brass tacks of managing money and changes in your income and all that, then you, you develop new social connections. And and suddenly you, you go from being like, uh, eat the rich, society uh, needs to be torn down to, you know, don't shoot, it's complicated. You know what I mean? <laughs> because it's that way where you understand the complexity of your own place in society, but you become an avatar and a caricature to other people. Yeah. And so suddenly you begin to see what, interests and fears and anxieties drive the centre ground of politics, whether it's centre left or centre right. It's not just about liberalism. It's about self-interest. It's about an, a space where you're prone to meet more politically diverse range of people, but mm -hmm. also to be in business with them in some way. So that's where this whole be civil and polite thing comes from, because it greases the wheels of your social mobility in the centre. So you don't have to have a difficult conversation with a Tory in a green room because you just accept Tories exist too. Mm -hmm. Because the political impact of their decisions is negligible on you. Yeah. You might pay more tax, you might pay less tax. Really, that's all that's affecting you. Yeah, yeah. Whereas down here, people's lives are thrown out of control. So what I'm trying to focus with the show, with the new book, is try to document this conflict within me because I think it speaks to the time that we're in. Mm -hmm where there's this ravine that's opened up between yeah. the winners and losers and each side of the ravine is informed by not just different politics, different finances, but whole different value systems that are very difficult to reconcile unless you know you have a, a strong economy and leaders who actually know what they're doing. I know that was a big rant there, but like that's kind of that that's where I'm at just now. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's where I'm at. There's a there's a couple of things which um spring to mind. The, the thing about looking at the centre and seeing mediocrity just because someone finds themselves in between extreme opinions. Mm -hmm. That is ubiquitous now, whether it's talking about left and right uh, or whether it's talking about um, nutritionists who get caught in a crossfire where they're saying something like, um, uh, listen... Uh, you know, and I think sometimes rightly they get caught in the crossfire because they say, I think you should have a healthy, balanced diet and eat in moderation. And I think those those terms are loaded. I think healthy, balanced, it really depends who you're talking to. Like Amber, who I was speaking to the other night, a healthy, balanced diet for her is meat or else she gets bipolar. Um, and eating in moderation is difficult for people like you and me mm. who find that they have quite an addictive pattern of behaviour. Mm. Um, but there's some nutritionists who are saying, listen, you don't have to do one thing. You don't have to do that thing. You have to work out what works for you, which is a moderate position. But they're getting caught in the crossfire because they're not taking an extreme position. And I think that happens in the centre of politics too. Yeah. You know, um, the other thing that I thought about was that you've got um, <laughs> these avatars of a status and... Food is huge in that regard. It's one of the first things that comes up. I mean, you use it comedically all the time. Mm. Other people do as well in a similar way. Quinoa or... Um, so that's how you say it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember seeing uh, Daniel Kitson do his stand-up and he's like... Uh, um, I, he was like, I just found out. You, you, it's called... It's uh, hyperbole. <laughs> it's like quinoa all over again. <laughs> 
thought it was hyperbole. <laughs> um, one of my favourite American stand-ups, uh, Brian Regan, is just so silly. He's a very funny guy. Uh, one of his best shows is called uh, The Epitome of Hyperbole. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, <Very good. laughs> but uh, I, you know, quinoa or, you know, couscous or extra virgin olive oil are just three that come off the top of my head, but there's loads. And I wonder if, um, like, kind of looking at how Scotland is, around um around class and around food do you think there's like how do you think a message of eating to empower could come about good question um we won't make inroads until people whether it's through education or kind of a cultural transformation having reached some sort of cliff edge ecologically uh, begin to re-establish their roots locally, regionally, within communities. Um, you can see pockets of this happening already. Someone came round to my house yesterday for a barbecue and brought some lettuce that they had grown in their garden. It was real normal lettuce, so therefore it immediately looks suspect and doesn't <laughs> feel right, it doesn't crunch in the right way, and you're like, I've been conditioned by these modified foods that are supposed to look sexy, mm. almost that I'm kind of turning my nose up at the real thing. And it's not the only, food's not the only area of my life where I've done that, you know? Um, but I do think and th- that we will, at some point, have to return to a simpler form of life. We'll still have our technology. We'll still have our conveniences. But this idea of, you know, like, getting things, you know, that, that, a, that a ready meal is comprised of, of foods from six different places in the world and all that, just so that you've got something you can scan before you go to the gym or something. It's ludicrous and not sustainable. Um, we need to make use of not just what resources we have locally, but a lot of the skills and talents of people. Because if we evolved in those cultures where it was about, you know, the, the local land what was available to us locally, socially, we worked together in groups to achieve those aims and needs when it comes to food, then given the fact we've not really evolved a great deal, it makes sense that that we would function more optimally if we felt some sort of relationship to the food that we eat, a sense of where it comes from. I mean, you know, Jimmy Reid's alienation speech was more about labour, the relationship to labour and feeling alienated from A lot work. of people won't know what that is, but I've got it printed out in my bookcase. It's mm. incredible. And I don't know why, but the video's not online. Yeah. It's there. It used to be online. I don't know why it's not, but it's 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 uh, Jimmy Reid was a... Um, a trade, tra- a trade unionist, unionist shops, sure die. Yeah, who, who did this address to the students of Glasgow University in 1972, was it? That's right, I was the rector yeah. of the uni. I'm, Vote, I'm friends in. with his daughter Eileen, um, who does a, 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 a... We are not rats. She does, she does exactly, she does a she does a bit where she uses the speech that still exists, the video version, and then she completes it. Right, right. Um, and it's quite powerful. But no, it's, 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 a brilliant, it's a brilliant address. But really what he was talking about was how the economy and the fact that it's designed around efficiency and these kind of like, you know, capitalist ideas that we naturally become disassociated from the mechanisms that constitute our own lives, like our work. What does it mean to work? What am I doing? What, mm-hmm. is, my, what is my function beyond selling my labour in a marketplace? Mm-hmm. What's my job? What's it connected to? What function does it serve? And there are so many occupations out there currently that really just exist to generate profit based on the fallacy that the more profit there is, the less poverty there'll be, which is false. And and so the, the that I think that that is in some ways analogous to food. You know, it's just this idea of mass multinational production. It pulls everything away from local people. It pulls power away, a sense of identity away. And also, when you are around in more affluent areas, no, this is not always the case, you notice that you're not far away from some greenery or a garden. Um, if you go to a boarding school, one of the things that your money pays for there is the lush grounds in which a school is set. Let me tell you something that I found out when I was in California about the about the Caltech campus. You mm. know, one of the 
richest private universities in the world and it's typified by um someone told me that a a, a rich um alumnus had left a billion dollar endowment for landscaping so the interest or dividends from that billion dollar endowment only goes to pay for the grounds yeah. keeping i and mean that, but that just shows you that how that how deep an understanding that person has of the physiological, emotional, psychological benefits yeah. of being near natural stuff. And, and you know, that's just true of being around other people often as you can and not isolating as it is. If you go to a boarding school or a private school, any window you look out, you're looking at a tree, mm -hmm. right? There's a reason for that. The reason the boarding school is so... The reason that an academically unremarkable child can ascend to almost the apex of society by going to that school is because the school is designed around maximising human potential and there's the money there to create that environment. Mm -hmm. Whereas a state school is about the constraints of the state financially and you get what you can get at what we can afford. Um, and so the, 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 I feel that shows that there is a need to feel connected feel connected to your community locally, feel connected to nature. What better way to do that than around food? I mean, it just makes so much sense. And I think there is a culture growing, you know, literally, where, I mean, I look at organisations like Gal Gale, for example, I mean, their whole raison d'etre is bring people in who have been suffering in different forms of life. Don't sit them down and ask what their hard luck story is. Get your uniform on. We're going to build a boat out of trees. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, let's carve something. And just that closeness yeah. with things that are natural yeah. just brings a wellness yeah. that help that can almost help any problem. Uh, and and I think, you know, food. I don't know who, what, what will drive this. You see corporations trying to hijack stuff mm -hmm. and say, oh, this initiative that's actually been going for ages, we are spearheading it. Um, because they're responding to consumer demand. But I think it's going to have to come from the ground up if it's really going to have the, the traction and the staying power to create that cultural sea change. Where It's hard because mm. better food costs more. Aye, but there are also, as you know, myths around that stuff as well. I think the cost for a lot of people is the labour cost of preparing food or, or the cost of sometimes the time to educate yourself on how to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is something... Uh, that I've learned is, is my life stabilised after a lot of years of alcoholism and all that, was uh, I can knock up something tasty and healthy pretty quickly, but I've got to know how to do that, and I've got to be in a community where that's being modelled to me mm -hmm. in some way. You can't just say someone who grew up on cheesy pasta and um, crispy pancakes, that they should just know mm -hmm. how to make a nice pot of chilli you know, that can last a whole week. So it's an environment thing, but it's also a, an education thing. Yeah. And, a, and a, I mean, this is, this is a, a, you, you see a lot of well-meaning um, groups doing that kind of education, but I, I, sometimes, I, I think, you know, more power to them, but I sometimes wonder whether it's, um, it's at risk of being taught down, of parachuting in. Yeah. Uh, you know, quinoa parcels or whatever. Yeah, you know, yeah. How... I mean, so, sometimes that is difficult. That's sometimes that whole kind of, that model of doing things, it, it's patchy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be done really well, other times not. In a socially segregated society, this is one of the problems we have. There's no cross-pollination of skills. So there's entire different lifestyles and value systems arise out of the, the very dramatically different social conditions. It's a parallel culture, like yeah, you said. Yeah, exactly. And one of the problems is that you can't... Uh, I mean, I was in London the other day, and uh, I was in London the other week, sorry. King's Cross, rush hour, right? I'm walking uh, towards this tube station. A guy comes walking out of a bicycle shop but he literally just gives the appearance of someone who's just decided, I'm going to buy a bike and cycle home. Fuck this. Like, so he literally, he had a problem. He had the means to conceive of a solution. He had the resource there to go into the shop. He had the finances to buy the bike and he just cycled home. That's real social mobility there. 
Now, his decision to do that and ability to do that is based on loads of different factors, but the main ones are he has the resource to do it, the means to do it are there, and that he has the idea that he can do it, which has been modelled to him by his friends and his family, who some of which might be cyclists. So he's watching them and he's thinking, they actually get about a bit better than me, they're healthier, the cycling malarkey looks like fun, maybe I should do it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you live in a community where people don't do certain things, how the hell are you supposed to learn how to do them without a middle class person parachuting in and telling you? The problem with the socially segregated society is that you don't have that natural trading of wisdom because there's loads of things people from further up the food chain can learn from lower class people or working class people. Loads of things, including how to have a fully formed sense of humour. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so it's... But like I've heard Billy Connolly say that <laughs> it's only working class and upper class people that know how to have a laugh. Aye, aye. So, it's so true though. And I've spoken with a few upper class people and I've found them actually to be more authentic and pleasant mm. to speak to, mm -hmm. which was weird, right? It was just <laughs> like we were just sitting there and it felt dead easy. Um, but the... You know, that's one of the issues that you create where, you know, even just in how, look at Glasgow, the, 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 the creation of, the, you know, the Radical Housing Programme, the creation of towns like Cumbernauld and East Kilbride, great, great, well-designed towns, but it was a kind of migration of certain type of people who went there. And so it left a kind of, it, it turned them both into ghettos. Yeah. One was a middle-class ghetto and one working class. I get it just being copious amounts of the same thing everywhere you look, you know what I mean? Um, so you don't get that transferable skill thing happening that's quite organic in communities that are diverse uh, and, and that finds expression in lifestyles in particular around food. But there are lots of people that you'll find in working class communities who can do all these things. Yeah. But the way that the system's set up, they might not know how to access funding pots. They might not necessarily have the self-esteem to move an idea forward. Mm -hmm. They're just kind of known locally as a bit of a sage. There's and also, that's cool too, you know. There's also well-meaning um, uh, activities that get, get stymied by regulation, which in itself is really well-meaning. So I've heard of a brilliant uh, um, thing called Chefs in Schools, where... It's in England somewhere. They went in to a few schools and basically due to procurement regulation so that someone isn't like getting their best mate to come in and do all the food for their school, you have to go through certain channels, approved suppliers that can provide a certain number of meals every week, guaranteed, you know, or, you know, so that the kids don't go hungry, all that. But what you end up with when you do that is chicken nuggets and yeah. uh, potato smiley faces. And then so someone was coming in, chefs were coming in saying, right, okay, the local authorities were given license to just let them buy whatever. They actually saved loads of money and it was real food. And so there's a, there's there's kind of, there's it's such a complicated issue. Yeah. Um, I mean, one, one, of the, 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 one of the things about capitalism that you'll hear from, at least from capitalists, and it's hard to deny uh, also, is just that... The, when something's mass produced, it brings the cost of producing it down, which brings the cost down for the consumer. So we can have this military grade technology for, you know, a few hundred quid, whereas it would be unattainable to us at a certain point. Yeah. Even people who have very little can attain this sort of stuff and it's important. Um but I think when it comes to food, there's a labour involved, there's an expertise required even for basic cooking. There might be certain forms of equipment that's required. Um, and, and those things become obstacles to people who have already got enough going on treading the quicksand of poverty. Uh, so the idea of trying a new thing mm -hmm. seems like a potential waste of energy when you've just got to concentrate on keeping things running smoothly. So it's, 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 it's just that this issue is just one of many problems that would be alleviated if we found a way to either pay people more or bring the cost of utilities and things down just to depressurise incomes a bit. So people's horizons can broaden a wee bit to, what are these new experiences? Uh, maybe I'll go on a cookery class and really participate in a way that a lot of m middle class people might find actually like just normal baseline life. Yeah. Um, but I've only got another kind of 10 minutes or whatever, but... Yeah. 
Um, you know, when it comes to where I'm at right now, when it comes to food, then now I know what I'm doing and I know what I should do. So that's half the battle. And I've also found as much as we all beat ourselves up on our various journeys, fitness journeys, uh, dietary journeys, lifestyle journeys, relationships, whatever, we're beating ourselves up almost. It punctuates that 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 kind of. Uh, that that self flagellation, that that self criticism, it punctuates the journey in, in a way that can make it quite miserable. But actually, I've found that over the, if I start looking at it in terms of years, I've seen big improvements. I've seen massive improvements. Now, when I'm eating something that's unhealthy, I know it's unhealthy. Yeah. Like I know it's not right that I'm doing it, whereas I didn't before. That's massive. Also, I know what else I could be doing. Mm -hmm. I know where to acquire the things that I need if I want them. These are massive things. Without those, there is no change. There's no change at individual level. There's no change at community level. So the information is available. It is filtering through. It's just that hopefully we can pass on to our children a better starting point to come from. Because what I'm having to do is adopt from eating like my granny and grandpa. Uh, to try and eat ethically, safely, in accordance with values as well as health. And, you know, when you've got a system that's hardwired to do the other thing, you're constantly in a battle with yourself. But it is winnable. Even if you go from eating crap seven nights a week to only doing it two nights a week, at an individual level and at a cultural level, these tiny changes accumulate massively. And, And so what I've learned is... If I stray off the tracks, uh, I'm not beating myself up about it, right? I'm not beating myself up about it. This is the world I've been born into. I think that's huge. Aye, and I'm trying to confront what my responsibilities are as an individual while also accepting that that this is the society that I'm in and maybe it's not necessarily just for me to figure it all out by myself as a consumer. Um, and my health has improved also. Uh, I started smoking when my son was born, which was unfortunate. Um, and I didn't have the skills when it comes to food that I do now. So when I stopped smoking, I just transferred onto the mm. crap and I, I put I used, on. I used to smoke 40 a day and I did that exact same Aye. thing. You need to have a plan in place, don't you? Yeah, and, and, it, it, does, and it does just take lots of time and, and you know... Uh, feedback on yourself. Aye, aye, because you're 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 doing it incrementally. Yeah. You want it all now. You're disappointed when you don't do it. But now, like I'm, you know, I'm in the gym three, four times a week, and two of those I'm training really, really hard. Other days I don't push myself quite so hard because I can't go and do a day of work. Yeah. When I'm totally done in, um, but that's unheard of for me even just a couple of years ago. You know, like if I'm not in the gym training. Um, then I don't feel right. I need to be there. Even if I've got an injury, I'll find something else to do. Yeah. And that becomes my pattern, you know, and it would take a lot to pull me off it. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I do recognise that part of the reason why I'm healthier and part of the reason why I'm, I think I'm happier, uh, or at least I have more cause to be happy, <laughs> even <laughs> if I refuse to be, is because my economic situation has changed. So... I can afford to do things that I wouldn't have before. Um, getting somebody to help me in the gym for the first few weeks just to help me make sure I'm doing things right. Yeah. Um, ordering in the food, you know what I mean? Like just get someone to deliver it within hours sometimes mm-hmm. if that's what we need to get something popping off in the kitchen. <laughs> do you know what I mean? We need carrots. The toddler needs carrots, you know. <laughs> it's 11 o'clock. Um, but all these things cost a wee bit more and they require a certain confidence as well to, to just even go beyond what's comfortable. Mm-hmm. So there is a there is definitely a relationship between economic freedom and a and, uh, healthy lifestyle. Yeah, for sure. I mean, th- so maybe you can say briefly then how, how that relates to your show that you're doing at The Fringe yeah. and um, what you want people to know about that. Well, the show's about social mobility, but this time from the perspective of someone who actually is benefiting from it. Because you did did your first Fringe show last year, which was a sellout show. 
sell out man I sold out eight shows I did a full run rest of them were maybe a, a few body shy of yeah, yeah. I but think it, you don't have to just sell 80% of your tickets to be sell out I thought maybe that maybe I got that wrong but, aye, aye. but it, it was obviously a, a, a sensation and it got well reviewed and aye. Um, it was a surprise to me because it was my first time doing the fringe but then with a lot of these things I'm going in with a lot more experience than I realise sometimes because I've really earned my stripes you know mm-hmm. locally or in Scotland so um, I'm a wee bit longer in the tooth maybe than I feel because of all the drink related amnesia. Uh, <laughs> but this year, the, 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 this isn't tied, this show's not tied into a book. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have a big machine of a, public, a, pub, uh, a publisher behind it, therefore. Yep. So it's good because I'm kind of, I've got, I, I'm, I'm hungry to make it work mm-hmm. in a way, using my own ingenuity, you know what I mean? I've got a publicist on it at different points, mm-hmm. but they target mainstream and a lot of the audience I'm going for aren't tuned into that stuff um i know you, i know you don't have much time but um i need i need to ask you this because i think about it all the time with comedians most of whom are left leaning mm. the the idea the which is very conservative is that we're all individuals who have to take responsibility for ourselves and pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps yeah and comedians are almost like the the ideal thatcherite unit mm-hmm. you know they work for themselves they are their own business mm. and it's similar for yourself i mean what do you think about that? In terms of your new show, and Aye. if you well, want to keep so, it short as possible. Well, that's fine. One of the... My... Right, so the success I'm enjoying just now is attributable almost exclusively, at least in the mainstream discussion around me, to the book Poverty Safari, right? That book, I wrote it. That's all I did, right? It was a publisher who agreed to publish it, having a previous publisher reneging on publishing it. mm because they received, they received terrible advice from someone who doesn't like me, right? Uh, that publisher that reneged on it went into liquidation the week my book became a bestseller, right? It was hard not to feel some kind of satisfaction about that. I felt bad for all the writers whose books got shelved. Mm. That could have been my book. That had nothing to do with my talent. That had nothing to do with my hard work. That was blind luck. J.K. Rowling got behind then, you. Yep, exactly. So she donated to a crowdfund that also generated a lot of interest and discussion and expectation around the book. And she helped out in other ways as well. I mean, she was a person who um, offered me a lot of comfort when I was very stressed writing the book. Mm-hmm. Because her situation when she was trying to become a writer was she had the young children, she was on benefits. So she was just working a sentence and a paragraph at a time and really grinding it out. Yeah. So that was helpful. But also, the the publisher who then agreed to do it the person who edited it, if I had published what I actually wrote before the editor got a look at it, then it would have been a whole different thing, trust me. And most writers would say the same thing. And then the final thing was the publicist who entered it into the Orwell Prize. She suggested the Orwell Prize and I thought, it's such a long shot, I'm not going to bother with that. It's stress, it's forms, mm. working class shit, you know, fuck that, <laughs> forms, you know what I mean, whatever, I'll wing it. And so she just entered it on my behalf anyway. And that's the thing that's changed the whole game for me. Now, I'm not saying they don't make your own luck. I'm not saying me sitting up and working on my writing craft when my competitors are in the pub doesn't mean that I don't deserve an opportunity more than them, perhaps. But at the same time, there are so many variables of randomness and kindness and generosity and encouragement at play that while I might think that I'm working on my own in the perfect Thatcherite unit, actually... The circumstances of the environment I was born into, as well as all the different people in my life at different points, including a lot of women performing a lot of unpaid labour until very recently. Um, then then uh, if I was to take sole credit for that, I would be delusional. You know, the, the earth wouldn't have existed if it wasn't in the Goldilocks zone, mm-hmm. which is where it needs to be for the sun for water to exist. And I think... On that cosmic scale, as much as the analogy might not seem fitting, it's the same for people. Ne- you know, 80% of what you're going to become and what your opportunities are is all about where you just happen to find yourself where you're born and then you, you, you do the rest yourself, whatever's available to you. So the show's really about that, you know. It's about social mobility, social immobility and how prosperity blinds you and numbs you almost. Even when you consider yourself committed to vulnerable or poorer groups Mm -hmm. uh, there's just no way that you can retain that visceral understanding of poverty I mean why would you if you could move on 
but that has political consequences and uh, and that's what I want to talk about brilliant alright well where can people get tickets and where can people find you besides that you can just google Scotland Today Darren McGarvey and the first thing that comes up should be the Edinburgh Fringe site you mm-hmm. can get them there you can also take the risk of trying to get tickets on the day but if opening night goes as well as it did last year, there'll be a strong word of mouth that will be generated from that and tickets get harder to come by as the month progresses. Is that the Stan Newtown Theatre? Stan Newtown Theatre. It's a full 60-minute show. Uh, I've got some spoken word in there. I've got comedy in there. And I've got a lot of, you know, rhetoric of the sort that you heard me talking in the interview of the day. You know, that's where my head's at. So I think, you know, regardless of your personal political persuasion or whatever... I think that it would be an experience unlike anything else that you might see at the Fringe, and that's always a good reason to go to a show. For sure. And you're pretty active on Twitter as well, right? I have to be, man. I have to be. And that's at? That's at Loki Scottish Rap. At Loki Scottish Rap. Yep. Nice one. All right. Well, thanks so much again for coming on. Pleasure.